In the land of 10,000 lakes, fishing is king. While anglers still like to keep a few for the frying pan, the catch and release mentality is growing. The tug on the end of your line is becoming more important than catching the best tasting fish. And that means that targeting non-game fish has become more common. So much so that the DNR is starting to look at new regulations on certain species of fish to protect them. All right, so there's one fish in northern Minnesota that's gotten more and more popular here in recent years. It used to be considered a trash fish. People would catch them and they just leave them on the ice and, and get rid of them. And then they got to be more popular as uh, the poor man's lobster, they were called. And that is the eel pout or the burbot or the ling or the lawyer, the cod, whatever you want to call this fish. It's a popular fish nowadays. It's actually been listed as a game fish now in Minnesota. They're talking about setting limits on it. And they're, they're fun fish to catch and they are delicious, but they're, be they're becoming more and more popular as a catch and release catch and release fish. So you can catch burbot on walleye gear. In fact, I've never actually targeted eel pout before. Anytime I've ever caught one's always been a bycatch when I've been walleye fishing. So I've got walleye gear, but now it's become so popular that you can actually get specialized tackle for burbot. And that's what we're gonna do today here at uh, Northwoods Bait and Tackle. We're gonna see what they got for catching some eel pout tonight. Hey, hey, how's it going? Hey, good. I'm good. Brett, Brett Amundsen. Tyler. Tyler, nice, nice to meet you. We want to catch some burbot tonight. What do we need? So we got this stuff here. These ones got some Big rattles nasty. in them. And uh, we also got these. They've been hitting on jigs pretty recently too. Um, anything with a lot of glow to it. Glow is key. And then you tip these with some minnow heads. Yeah, minnow heads. heads you know. I kind of like the idea of this rattle though. Yeah. Being able to make Draws a lot of noise a down there. More. All right, well, I'm gonna take a couple of the glow jigs and a couple of the glow rattles. So have you seen an increase in popularity for burbot? A lot of people coming in here asking about what to use and yeah, how to sure. target them? There's, there's a lot of people coming in asking what to use. Um, most people are getting fat heads too. They're getting the big nasty lures. You're guaranteeing us one of those tonight, right? Oh yeah, maybe maybe not that the big, but record yeah, from 2012? You'll, you'll, you'll catch some, for All sure. Right. We learned that Big Nasty Tackle was made just down the road from Bemidji in Cass Lake. So we made our way there to see how these jigs were made. Matt, where are we right now? We're in Cass Lake, Minnesota, home of Big Nasty Tackle. Right, and we're also inside a uh, tackle shop and a pawn shop. Yep, MD Pawn and Bait, um, part owner here at the bait shop. and. We bought, we're fortunate enough to buy a tackle company a couple years ago, and we're just trying to make it work. How long ago did this tackle start? Uh, Adam Forsyth started about 10 or 11 years ago, I believe, and we were fortunate enough to buy it. This is our third season, I believe, with, with Big Nasty Tackle. He did a good job, handed it over to us. He's helped us out tremendously, and we just keep trying to expand the line, add new colors, add new product. You know, it's not easy starting new tackle or starting a new tackle company. Everything is so crowded in the, in the fishing world these days, and everybody's making tackle, it seems like. But when you have the popularity growing of a fish that hasn't been targeted, I mean, what a great opportunity to, to make tackle specifically for those fish. So you make these right here? That's correct, right in the store. Can you show me how to do it? I sure can. You're talking about pouring alternatives to lead, which is also a really important thing these That's days. That's correct. We're using a 928 tin, and it comes in pucks like this when we buy it. We melt it in a lead pot. We've got a couple different sizes. How easy is it to acquire this? It's expensive. They, these come in three bars. They're $146 for a bar. Holy smokes. Yeah, so it's wow. quite expensive, but it is the future. We know that. Uh, it, all the European Union, you can't use lead. So we're trying to break into that market a little bit, expand it. So we've decided to do some alternative with that. And then we use our jigs, our, our molds here. And basically, we put all the components we have to put in, and it comes out, the mold looks like this. And then we have to finish the process by breaking this tip off and sand them smooth so we could paint them. 
I've seen this glow paint in action on these. I want to know where you keep the radioactive material because <laughs> I've never seen anything glow it's, like this. It's under lock and key in the safe. <laughs> <laughs> you ship these uh, a lot of places? I ship them, a lot of them to Canada, many of the states out west, uh, Michigan, Maine. Uh, I ship them to Norway and Sweden also I've got shipments going to. <laughs> well, thanks a lot, man. Good luck with Thank everything. You. Thank you. I appreciate it. Now that we had our gear, it was time to go fishing. We got to the lake here tonight. We heard this was a spot to go, and when we got here, there was these two guys selling Girl Scout cookies. Let's go see who it is here. Oh, it's Jason Rylander and Jason Durham, ladies and gentlemen. How odd that we see you guys here. Oh, weird. Selling Girl Scout cookies. <laughs> What are you guys doing? We're going eel pile fishing. Oh, really? Did you guys bring any gear? Yeah, we got some gear. Oh, okay. Can you bring any snowmobiles? Can you ride out on your snowmobiles with you? Yeah. Okay, perfect. Yeah. We got Girl Scout cookies. Is there some eel pile out here? There's some eel pile out here. All right, let's go get them. The Jasons are both fishing guides and have spent a lot of hours chasing this unique fish. With daylight fading, I wanted to get a good look at the bottom structure with an underwater camera before it got too dark. And it didn't take long to see what we were after. <laughs> I told you. I think we're on the spot. I was having more fun with the camera than I should have. And I probably should have grabbed a rod, but I was enjoying seeing the fish and listening to Jason Rylander give Jason Durham a hard time about his hole drilling skills. I like this hole, Jace. How did you do this? What? I've never seen a oval auger before. It's, it's like round and then an extra. And Jason Rylander has gotten to be known for his burbot obsession. And like many people, his first encounter was while walleye fishing. Catching an eight pounder on Lake Bemidji by accident and it was incredible. Like, it was an eight pound fish, fought like crazy. Why would I not want to go chase these on purpose and experience that fight over and over again? That's what, that's really what got me hooked was that, that first one. Since he was one of the first people to bring Burbot into the spotlight, it only made sense that he caught the first one tonight. I was one of the, the few back in the day. I mean, that's how I met Matt Brewer was, was out eel pot fishing. It was March and we were the only two people on all of Lake Bemidji. Uh, of course, we gravitated towards each other, fishing the same piece of structure. So I got to know him. I got a job working for him as a guide. While well, Jason's ability to catch these unique fish made him popular, a burbot hot tub photo that went viral sent him over the top. It wasn't quite the picture I had in my head. I kind of imagined me in, in the water more and some eel pout over my legs a little bit more. But man, that water was cold and that ice well just wasn't quite big enough. <laughs> Fishing is supposed to be about fun. Catching limits is always nice, but at the end of the day, your measure of success shouldn't be based on what you're taking home. And when it comes to Minnesota lakes, there may be no one having more fun on them than Jason Dura, who got into burbot fishing in recent years. Oh, got off right under the hole. Classic. I would have got that if somebody was over here helping me. Classic Durham. <laughs> to tell you honestly, the first time I really didn't want to go and it was this guy, Mr. Rylander, that convinced me to go out eel pout fishing and uh, we had actually met on social media. Hadn't, hadn't, <laughs> hadn't, yeah. We, we had originally met on social media through uh, some mutual friends and he invited me to go eel pout fishing and honestly, I really didn't want to go. I wasn't interested. And then when we went the first time, we just, we hit it off so well in terms of our personalities. And in addition, we caught a whole bunch of eel pout and I was hooked from that point on um, and now, man, I just, I've dove in head first in terms of the, the world of eel pout, um, researching, you know, how they act and why they act the way that they do, different techniques, different baits, uh, different bodies of water. And yeah, I absolutely love them. The two friends both guide for different guide companies, but have been working together enough to get referred to as the Jasons. And after spending some time on the ice with them, it's easy to see why. I'm looking for sharp breaks. I'm looking for hard bottom. Wherever the crayfish is, that's uh, where the eel pot are gonna be. <laughs> that was that was to a T. That was that was gorgeous. That's my line. 
though they will eat minnows and other things too, crayfish are a primary food source. And so we're just fishing right along that transition. We're in 17 feet of water, and it varies from lake to lake in terms of the depth that you're going to target. Uh, some lakes you might be shallower than 17 feet. Some lakes are gonna be much, much deeper. Nice fish. I, I did absolutely nothing. I tell you what, uh, we've had some fish come through and just really negative. So I put the rod in the holder about three feet, had the bait about three feet off the bottom. I watched it come up to it and it denied it. And then I started shaking it and moving up faster. It hit probably six feet off the bottom. That is a healthy, healthy eel pout. Beauty. Well, it kind of surprised me. I was just pounding the bottom. I hadn't seen any fish for a little while. And all of a sudden I got a bite. Set the hook, nice little male, lots of cool little colors on them. It's one thing I really love about the eel pout is each one's like a snowflake. They're all, everyone's different. They got different color patterns. Pretty cool to see these cool black markings that they get. That's the straightest it's been. <laughs> That's a great shot. It's bugging me a little bit. When you ask people about eel pout, they usually talk about their appearance and their squirmy reaction to getting caught. They're wiggly and it's hard to get them straight for photos and things like that, but they don't actually wrap around your arm. That one definitely couldn't because it wasn't big enough. <laughs> the best burbot fishing is in a short window from late February through early March. Yes, you could catch them December, January, here and there, but they're very, very spread out. Uh, kind of different parts of the wall or the water column and you can catch them here there I mean mostly just stay out after you're done walleye fishing a little bit longer and you might catch some meal pout as they group up now pre-spawn you've got a four to six week wing window to to learn you know when I first started doing it I would pick a lake and that's the lake I fished I'd maybe pick one or two lakes and just fish that lake just to try to learn some spots, figure stuff out, and then the next year move to, move to something else, do some more exploring, and that's really how I learned uh, populations in diff our different lakes around Bemidji. A lot of trial and error, a whole heck of a lot of gas, and a lot of fruitless nights, really. Oh! Ha <laughs> ha! Come here, buddy. Just a little guy, but this one was aggressive. This one didn't hold back at all. And you know, there's good numbers, whoops, of this size of fish out here. And that's great for the future. You know, eel pout are somewhat slow growing and it, it really varies from lake to lake, just like you see with other species too, that you gotta give them some time. <clears throat> But this is great for the future of eel pout fishing out on this lake. You can see they just have really, really tiny eyes. And so having glow and scent and pounding that on the bottom is really critical for getting these fish to come in and bite. Eel pout actually have really high and stringent clean water requirements. And people think of them as these swamp creatures and, and that they're in these back bays. A lot of times people equate them to, to dogfish and they're very, very different. They need clean water. And if you ever had a decline in water quality, it would be one of the first species that are affected. The DNR's move to classify the burbot as a game fish is a result of increased angling pressure and research. You know, we, we got to assist with a study that took place where there was uh, some telemetry done on the fish, tracking. Um, in terms of us helping out, we got to catch the fish. Um, and th there were a number of anglers that assisted with that, but so cool to see how they went about that process. They're inserting tracking devices into the fish and tracking the fish for about 14 months. But as for like feedback that we've given the DNR, we, we've gotten some surveys and stuff in terms of uh, limits because now eel pout being designated as a game fish, the DNR can actually put limits on the fish, which I think is a, a great move forward. I think for the most part, people really respect the species. They're not prolific spawners, in, in my personal opinion, so I think conservation is, is very, very important with them. And I, it's just cool seeing the respect they're getting. While they are known as a poor man's lobster when it comes to table fare, 
most of the new anglers aren't keeping them. And tonight, we made the decision to put them all back. You know, for, for a number of reasons. Not that they're not great to eat because they are, but part of it is time of day. You know, you're getting home late. Part of it is that I just want to catch them again. That fight is what's most addictive to me, the pursuit. Now, just as we were packing up to go, Jason Durham set the hook one more time. Very hit. Oh, I want to get that. Oh, nice. There we go. Get that for you, Jace. <laughs> <laughs> oh, little weight to that one. No. That's not, a, that's not an <laughs> ear part. <laughs> well. <laughs> <laughs> Good release. I think, I think it actually got stuck in the hole here. <laughs> Come on, bud. There you go. <laughs> We're not, pike aren't supposed to bite at night. No. <laughs> well, I appreciate you having us out here. It's a good time. Jason, Jason, thank you very much. Thank you, Brett. Thank you. Thank right. you. When are we going <laughs> bourbon hot tubbing? <laughs> Funding for this program was provided by the Minnesota Environment and Natural Resources Trust Fund, Safe Basements of Minnesota, your basement waterproofing and foundation repair specialist since 1990. Peace of mind is a safe basement. Live wide open. The more people know about West Central Minnesota, the more reasons they have to live here. More at livewideopen.com. Western Minnesota Prairie Waters, where peace, relaxation, and opportunities await.